Director of Community Development for Citibank's Global Consumer Group since 2007. In his role, he is responsible for community development for the Midwest region, which includes 17 states in the U.S. and Canada, with a primary focus on the Chicago market, so we're happy to have him here. Mr. Wright began his career at Citicorp, Citibank in Illinois, as a home loan originator. He later took on the responsibility of national sales trainer at Citicorp Mortgage. Mr. Wright then moved to branch banking at Citibank where he managed all sales activities for the second largest bank in Illinois. Mr. Wright then became a CRA and Fair Lending National Marketing Manager where he worked with all Citibank entities from a CRA and Fair Lending Marketing perspective. And CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, that's the act that came about that says banks, if you don't play nice with the community, it's the government has an issue with you. And I saw an article recently that there's some conversation around that. Mr. Wright then joined GMAC Mortgage as Senior Vice President in Emerging Markets. GMAC Mortgage launched GMAC Bank, FSB, and as a founding Senior Director, he was asked to take on the role of National Director of Community Reinvestment and Director of Customer Care. Mr. Wright then became Senior Vice President for CRA, Fair Lending, and Consumer Care at GMA Bank. Previous to returning to City, Mr. Wright served as the Director of Emerging Market at Washington Mutual. Mr. Wright received his BS degree in Psychology from St. Joseph College and did his graduate studies at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Would you please help me welcome Mr. Wright? Thanks for that kind introduction. Most of that really means that I've um, not stayed still for very long because they catch you. So um, you, you keep things moving, but, but I'm certainly uh, honored and pleased to be here. And Philip asked me and Gloria asked me to, to talk about leadership. Um, and for me, um, talking about leadership, and let me just get a quick uh, show of hands so I know who I'm addressing in the crowd. How many of you all work in the nonprofit arena or you actually are an executive director? Perfect. Um, so some of this will be um, sort of redundant and elementary for you all, but I hope I'm able to say something that might um, spur your thinking perhaps in a different direction. Um, and while I've never actually worked in a nonprofit, what I do every day is to support nonprofits in terms of both philanthropy as well as uh, what we call corporate engagement or corporate citizenship. And, you know, I'm responsible for at least in the Illinois region of putting about $7 million on the streets in the hands of nonprofits annualized. And um, I took that, take that responsibility of corporate citizenship because when I come with the checkbook, it doesn't say George Wright on it. It says city on it, and that's a serious, as Otis introduced Ari, would attest to, that's a serious responsibility. Um, so leadership. So in the essence of time, and, and thank you all for allowing me to, to interrupt your lunch, um, I will only talk about three things in terms of leadership. I could talk about a lot more, um, but leadership is something that there is a healthy bait around, and let's just be honest, are leaders born or are leaders made? Well, I think that's a great question. I happen to think that leaders are born, but leaders can be made better. So how did I get to this? How did I get to this epiphany, if you will? Well, I got to it when I was 14 years old and I was in high school and I was, you know, you can see by my size, I'm not a very big guy, but I decided that football was a sport I wanted to pursue. And going into my sophomore year, the quarterback, who was the quarterback of our football team as a freshman, was bigger, stronger, and faster than I. And a white gentleman who was a coach at Michigan State came up to me and said, you will be the leader of this team. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Frank is bigger. He's stronger. 
and he's faster. He said, but he's not a leader. So therefore, there are leadership qualities, I think, that are innate and are in you that can be sharpened, right? It's like the knife. The knife can be sharpened, but there has to be a knife. But the, a good leader understands that a knife doesn't make the meal. You need the fork and you need the spoon. Those are the people that you're leading. So what makes a good leader? Well, I think there's three things. Number one, you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that you have to run a, non, run a small business, although I would make the case that most people running nonprofits are actually running small businesses. But you don't have to have that. The spirit of an entrepreneur is something that you have to have. And I'm going to make a statement. That statement is someone who gets stuff done takes accountability, which inspires others. Well, let's break that statement down. It means that a person that's a leader actually gets stuff done. Now, does that mean that the person is making excuses? Is the lights too bright? The grass was too high? The sun was shining in my eyes? Leaders get stuff done. Now, the next statement says that they take accountability. Why is that important? Why is it important for a leader to take accountability? How many of you all in leaders have failed in some type of endeavor? Did you take accountability for it? Or did you say that it was somebody else's fault? Did you point the fingers at someone else? That's not leadership. Leadership takes accountability. And how does that inspire someone that, work, that is under your tutelership, under your leadership? How does taking accountability help them? We're going to make this interactive because I got some warriors in the house today. I got some witnesses. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Otis, yes. how does, because I'm going to call on people if you, if you don't say anything, how does taking accountability inspire those that are under your leadership? Well, I harken back to 10 years ago when we piloted a concept uh, with Citibank, it was your leadership, and that Helen at the time, uh, helping your borrowers who were at risk of foreclosure. And my agency role in that effort was to make sure that the data you needed on impact was received to Citibank very timely by another agency. And when I heard you reference this question, I began to immediately think about that because when one agency didn't respond in timely enough impacting the effectiveness of your reporting, uh, I made it, I took the responsibility for that, that, that communication failure. And I think by not passing the blame around, which I probably could have easily done, I took the responsibility it inspired the others in that collaborative to work just as hard that if one was falling down, then we all need to pick up to make sure data got in on time because we understood the lives that were being impacted by a systems failure. So the answer is, well, let me turn the question around. Is the lack of taking responsibility in terms of leadership is that inspirational? No. Exactly. That's the simple answer. People understand that when they are following someone and that person takes accountability for both the successes, you know, it's like being married. Sometimes your wife has to stand beside you. Sometimes she has to stand in front of you. And sometimes she's got to stand behind you. The secret of that is when do you do it? And that's leadership. Leadership is about the good of the many will always outweigh the good of the one or the few. That's accountability, which is inspirational. That's number one. So be an entrepreneur. Number ne the next one is, and this one is what, one where people, they really don't get what I'm talking about here mostly. So I'm going to try it and see if you get it. The statement is simple. Think small, but accomplish big. Let me repeat that. You got it. What is it? If you think small, you can accomplish that goal. You can't accomplish a big goal without getting the small goal out of the way. First, you got to get the small goal to get to the big goal. Exactly. So I have a, I coined a phrase, and I've heard it. I didn't make it up, so I heard it, but it resonates, and it says exactly what you says. 
The statement goes like this. It's not the touchdown. It's how you march down the field. Let me say that again. It's not the touchdown. It's how you march down the field. People call this process over progress. They call it process over goal setting. Because what happens is simply this. If you set a goal and you don't understand that there's a process to get there, what happens to the goal? It becomes a dream, right? It's the only way, in fact, the statement is so, is so provocative that it says in many ways when you understand process over goal as a leader, the goal becomes anticlimactic. The touchdown must happen. It's not if it's happening, it's what? It's when it's going to happen because you have set the processes in place to make sure that goal becomes a reality. And if you don't understand the process over the goal and you try to set these big audacious goals and you haven't set up a process, it becomes a pipe dream. Leaders fail so many times because they're goal oriented, because it goes back to the first one. They want to get stuff done. But if you understand how you have to march down the field, and the joy of the goal is how you march down the field. Do I do a down and out? Am I going long today? Am I doing a little short pass? Do I need to run around the end? That's the beauty of leadership. The goal must happen if you march down the field correctly. The last thing is be strategic. Now, what does that mean? And it goes back to the previous point I made, because I coined a phrase on this one as well. How do you eat an elephant, Ari? One bite at a time. Who said it? Who said it first? One bite at a time. That means strategy. Because if you just think, well, I'm going and, and the elephant's too big and it's a big goal, if you don't take one bite at a time in a strategic manner, the elephant will consume you, not you consume the elephant. We work in a society where the elephant is against us. The elephant is about to try to stomp you to death. And if you are not strategic as a leader, you will find yourself under the belly of the elephant. And that's not a comfortable place to be. So let me, let me kind of, you know, in, in, the, in the words of, of training or talking about things, it's the old saying, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> right? It's, it's how we are taught to, to educate and train people. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So I just told you, you got to have a spirit of entrepreneurship. You don't have to run a small business, but you got to get stuff done. And you got to take accountability. And you have to make sure that your accountability is inspirational. I told you, you got to be in a situation where you're thinking small, but accomplishing big. Because if you want to accomplish, you have to think small. And you have to be strategic. You cannot be transactional. Because to be transactional, gets you under the belly of the elephant. But there's one last thing, and it's the reason why I was late. Um, my mother taught me something that has um, proved me, proved to be true, and helped me in my, throughout my career. She said, son, when you're early, you're on time. When you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, forget about it. She didn't believe in CP time. And she taught me that from an early age because you are being disrespectful to those who are on time. Never disrespect those who are on time for those who are late. I was late because a dear friend of mine lost his mother. And he asked me to say a few words at his mother's funeral this morning. And I have to go back um, to the ceremony of the repast or whatever you call it to pay my respects to, to Norman's mother. But Norman's mother said something about that relates to this topic about leadership when she told her son, who then told me, the only thing we take to heaven is our character. You can't take your car. Your clothes won't go, Phil. It's your character. Your character has been exemplary, as all of you. So when you can take your character heaven, right, that's about leadership. So you can be an entrepreneur and have that spirit. You can think small but accomplish big. You can be the best strategic thinker in the world.
But if your character is not good, it's all for naught. And character is something that it comes out like rust on a car. You cannot hide it. It's evident. You, you know it when you see it. And here I'd like to, for us to give, as I close, with congratulating all of you all for working in the, on the trenches and working with your clients and me trying to support you all as an intermediary. I'd like for all of us, um, because this may not happen a lot more times, than to give a resounding standing ovation to a person who has had the most impact on my life in terms of character and that is Mr. Philip Jackson.